Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Here's to you for joining us on this Monday morning, the first day of March 2021, the local time. Nine fifty one. And we will begin our program on the Olympic Peninsula starting at the top of the hour. That's less than 10 minutes from now. I, uh, it's a beautiful morning here. It's going to be 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I uh, took an extra scenic route on my bicycle this morning and I pedaled by the Ford dealership. An old Pat Kelleher from Kelleher Motors was outside and he's an old friend. So, and Pat's a talker. So 10 minutes later, I'm like, hey, I got to get to school. So I just, uh, that's why we're late. <laughs> All right, are we functional? Can you hear me okay? Where are you viewing from? We've got already plenty in the room here. Uh, Northern California, Kansas City, Newport, Washington, 5x5, five five, thanks to the report. Indianapolis, Indiana, Philly in the house. Northern British Columbia. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 5x5, five five. thank you. Berlin, Germany, hello. Uh, Brussels, Belgium, scrolling very quickly now. Arkansas, Snake River Plain, Friday Harbor, Washington, my couch. Uh, Fort Worth, Texas, including a zip code. Portage, Indiana, Calgary, Alberta, Finland is here. Uh, I'd love to be able to read every one of yours, but uh, as you know, things get uh, crowded in here. My God, we got more than 400 already? Uh, Athens, Greece, hello. Brookings, Oregon. I try not to say the same towns every day, by the way, in case you see a little extra work going on here. Uh, South Australia, Holland. Uh, Switzerland, what up, homie? Olympia, Washington, Palm Springs, California. Looks like we're functional. That's a good thing. Um, so a couple quick programming notes. We've got some good energy in the room already for, from the, the, the small crowd that's, that's assembled here. Um, there's not many of these left. I mean, you turn the page to March and then you go, oh, okay. There's four live streams this week, part of this Geology 101 series, four of them this week, today, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday. Uh, but our last live stream will be March 11th, which is a week from Thursday. And that will be uh, number 34. So 34 is the end of the line for us. And then, uh, I don't know if you thought that far ahead, if you thought these were going forever or whatever, but uh, the end of the quarter is approaching. You can feel it in, in the room. The end is in sight. Um, and I'm starting to think seriously about next quarter, which begins in late March. So at the end of this month, we'll be beginning our uh, spring quarter. And I'm Pretty sure, although not officially sure, but pretty sure that I'll be live streaming at least once a week. I'm pretty sure, but not officially sure, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific will be our live streams this spring. I'll, I'll, I'll let you all know about it, but I'm just giving you a heads up just in case you're... Uh, wondering if there'll be any more of this live stream stuff, because our audience does continue to grow, which is wonderful to see. We have 600 now, but I just mean subscribers and the whole thing. It seems like the word is still kind of getting out about what's going on here, and that's, that's of course, very pleasant to see. So all I'll say so far is that probably at least once a week in the spring, maybe more, but at least once a week, Almost certainly Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific time, I'll be live streaming um, some new stuff. We'll just leave it at that for now. Okay. So whatever, whatever the last Tuesday of March is, that'll be the first one probably. But 
it's time for us to be thinking carefully about uh, this morning. I'm talking to myself now. And um, Tawny, uh, dad, uh, were you home over the weekend, Tawny? Yeah. So, where was that? Uh, Port Orchard. So Tawny went over to uh, the Seattle area, actually beyond Seattle, part of the Olympic Peninsula, actually. And Tawny was talking to her folks about the Mount St. Helens 1980 session that we had. And uh, Tawny's dad, who was 12 years old at the time, put a little scrapbook together of the events of 1980. And so there's this vintage. I love the way old things smell, except for people. What? Uh, so there's uh, this is from the Seattle Post Intelligencer, RIP. Anyway, there's a Harry Truman section here as well, some other stuff. So Tawny has loaned this to me for the day. And uh, I'm sure some of you have your own memorabilia from that uh, very memorable uh, event. That's how memorabilia works, right? Okay. Uh, hellos to a few more. The room has gotten quiet, even though more people have showed up. I guess they're listening to us. But you know what? No, we're not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to go talk to the students, Okay. So we'll begin in three minutes. Thank you for joining us. Olympic Peninsula, hope you enjoy the session. Bryce, what do you got? Tim's here, even though he's officially a graduate student now. JC's here. Christina, haven't seen you in a while. You doing okay? You went, you went to Port Orchard too. This is a carnelian agate. Mm -hmm. Is it carnelian or cornelian? Car. Car. Like drive a car, nelian. And I'm supposed to go, wow, I've never seen one like this, which I'm about to do. You ready? Wow, I've never seen one like this. Just like yours. Just, Just like yours. mine, only bigger and better. This is from the Willamette that your dad found when he was working in the, oh, you were, in the, on the Willamette? Well, as we talked last time, I, I have no idea what's going on with carnelian agates. I don't understand if they are created in a very specific volcanic setting. I assume it washed down from the Cascades. What do you think? No clue. They're just sitting there just at, the, at the Willamette, everywhere. Just pick them up. Just chilling around. And why are they so prized? Are they, were, are they, do people buy them and sell them and all that stuff, you think? Mm. Carnelian agates? Occasionally. Let's see. Like it's, it's right in there with gold and blue agates and stuff. Like, oh, carnelian. I just am a carnelian uh, freak or whatever. The reds. I think yeah. the reds are yeah. cool. The reds are cool. Like, you can kind of see it right on the edge. Yeah. yeah. Uh-oh, he's going into his pocket. I don't know, I have to send some paperwork to see what you're going to pull out of your pocket here. This guy. Ooh, hello. Yeah, that is nice. I can see why it would just be something you'd pick up. Again, I don't, I don't know if I'm that interested, to be honest, but I, I've always meant to kind of, maybe this spring. We're going to do some agate stuff in that 351 with the blue agates, but uh, I don't know, maybe... You've never heard any talk of carnelians around here, have you? I haven't. I've heard there's some in Washington, supposedly. supposedly Actually, now that I... Supposedly southern, but I don't know. Well, now that, now that I say that, I think there was a guy who used to visit my office too many times with agates, and he was down kind of by Selib, outside of Yakima, on, on a kind of a bench. And so he, he was real interested in that, that ancient rivers lecture that I gave a few years ago, because of course, you know, if you've got deposits from an old river, then you've got these agates brought in by an old river. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for bringing those in, Bryce. Morning, Casey. JC. Hi, Nick. Keep going. I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm putting a microphone next to you so the home audience can hear your uh, how you deal with your uh, disciples. Go ahead. Uh, we found Thank you, Tommy, for laughing at that, by the way. Mason, go. Well, we're discussing a study group because we always form them for the finals, but sometimes the quizzes, which are still worth a few points, are right. a bit difficult. 
Yeah. And they were nice to pat out the grades. So we're thinking about doing a study group today for the quiz tomorrow. In person or uh, online? Uh, both, because there's always some people who can't come in person, so I'll host one online. Damn. Okay, what time? Uh, well, probably four, because that's the time that's worked in the past. Mm. However, if people express dissent, I'll make it earlier or later. Mm. Uh, and then I'll probably do the online one then at one because that's what we've done for the past. Okay. Well, I'd come, but I got to play with my cat at four. You should show us pictures of your cat tomorrow after the quiz or during the quiz. I don't own a cat. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Actually, I do. Yeah, I should I should show you pictures of a cat and then that would... Uh... Not of your cat, just a cat. Oh, God. That's even more <laughs> pathetic. I mean, it would... Well, yeah. A dog that acts like a cat. That's the report from Tawny, or possibly Eve. Oh, Eve, how's your pet? Eve, how is your animal? Was it sick? Your dog? Yeah. Your your dog has separation anxiety. Oh yeah. Well she was in a puppy mill for a month. But she gets like vomiting whenever I leave. Oh god. I decided I didn't want to get a Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's beautiful outside, wouldn't you say? And I think it's going to be beautiful all week long. So we are enjoying our emergence from wintertime and uh, communing with the outdoors. I hope that you can get outdoors as much as possible. We all need that this time of year. Let's talk about this week and most specifically tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is quiz number three. You can barely read it here, but quiz three is tomorrow. And I mentioned this on Friday, and if you weren't with us, I'm sure you saw the live stream, but let me just say something quickly again. So tomorrow we are having a lecture. It will be on Celestia. We don't know anything about Celestia yet. The first 10 minutes of tomorrow, you remember what we do with quizzes, right? The, just the first 10 minutes will be this quiz number three. I will be quizzing you on material since the Farallon Plate Lecture. That's the beginning of what I will test you on, starting with the Farallon Plate Lecture, page 33, essentially, up through today's material. So it's fair game for me to t quiz you tomorrow on what we're doing today. In fact, I will be throwing a couple things from today on the quiz tomorrow. As always, these quizzes are just a way to connect with you, make sure we don't have too much water going under the bridge. But I do have breaking news for you. We're in the home stretch of this class. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the syllabus, but a week from this Friday is our final exam. I'm giving you a, a final exam in this class. Our last gathering will be a week from this Friday, and it will be test number three, and I'll tell you about that later this week. But there's only seven classes left. Four this week, three next week, and then we take the final exam. So we will finish strong. We're about to get into a portion of the class that I have completely scrambled and rewritten based on stuff that I've learned recently. And I, I have one set of ideas that are very, very exciting. And it's breaking news in many cases involving the geology of the Pacific Northwest, not just Washington. Exotic terrains is what I'm talking about. So there'll be four sessions on exotic terrains starting tomorrow. And I'm really looking forward to doing that with you. But we got to take care of our quiz tomorrow. Any questions about the quiz tomorrow? We're good. Still trying to get a sense of the energy in the room. I also want to remind you, this is the last time I'll show you this, but registration is happening this week for freshmen, first-year students, uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors have already been registering the last couple of weeks. This is a strongly suggested class. If you're all interested in continuing Geology 203, you have the prerequisite right now by completing this class. Let's assume you'll complete the class. You'll be, you just jump right into 203. It's only three credits. Bryce is taking the class. A few others who might be in this class will also be there next quarter. Uh, there'll be a little bit of in-person as well as some virtual stuff. That's a highly suggested thing. Please email me if you're interested about that. Also, geomorphology is an option for you as well. If the 203 doesn't turn you on, the geomorphology land studies is also 386. Final announcement. 
There is no lab this week. Remember this? There is, you're done going to the lab room. You are done. You took the laboratory final exam last week. But most of you are registered for my lab section, and I sent you an email. Did you receive it? My full name is Nicholas Zetner. That's the way my email reads these days. And so please look for an email. I've sent an email to you twice about Geology 101 Lab. I've only heard from a couple of you. And Friday at 5 p.m. of this week is the deadline for you to get the remaining virtual labs to me by email. Please find that field trip virtual email. I sent it twice, but... If I don't get anything from you Friday at 5, we're done. I'm not, I'm not, you know, extending. I'm not working something out with you, okay? So I know you got a lot going on. Please do those virtual field trip reports and email them to me, and there's other options about how to get that stuff to me as well. Eve? If you are, yes, if you are officially registered in Ben or Zach's lab, you received an email from them, and they basically copy and pasted what I sent to my students. Mace. Yes, thank you. E please email me to remind me to do that. Okay, let's get started. This is the outline. You've had plenty of chance to look at it. Now, we know the approach. We're going to keep that approach, the approach that we learned last week. Do you remember? Collecting our field data. That's not the sexy part. And then telling a story. So we're going to go to the Olympic Peninsula today. And first of all, just break open some rocks. Just make some observations and be confined to doing that. And then, after that, we'll talk about something called the Big Three, we'll go down to the state of California for some reason, and then by the end of the day, we'll, by the end of today, we'll be back to Washington. Okay, so I rewrote this lecture for a number of reasons. Um, that will become clear as we go on this week. I think I want to do this. This is our first chance looking at the state of Washington on my chalkboard. You know, we've done the Pacific Northwest outline, but these are the painted lines for the state of Washington. And I debated whether I want to do this, and I think I just decided I want to do it. We have 20 people in the room. Um, I'm going to make a little mark on this map for every one of your hometowns to help our home viewers see where you're all from, to help me see where you're all from. And we'll eventually get to here, which is our topic today, the Olympic Peninsula. Okay, so this is Seattle. Ellensburg would be about right here. I guess that's Wenatchee. I forget what this is even, what that gold dot is. And here's Tri-Cities. Bryce is from Carson. Carson is down here. I'm just going to make it real quick. Casey, where are you from? Renton. Renton. This will be a quiz for me, basically. Uh, JC. Bothell. Bothell. North of downtown Seattle, Tim, Ellensburg, uh, Pedro, Granger, a little south, Mason. Mason, give me a town. Bellevue. Bellevue. Emily is from Easton. Emily, two. Emily, one is from Bickleton. Uh, uh, Christina is from Port Orchard over here on the Olympic Peninsula. Karen. Bonnie Lake. Bonnie Lake. That is south of Olympia. Oh, Olympia's down. Is that Olympia? That's down over here. This is fun for me. Maybe that's it. Uh, Aiden. Maple Valley. Maple Valley is on uh, 405 uh, heading towards Renton. Um, Eve. Yakima. Tawny. Port Orchard. Another one represent. Two on, from the Olympic Peninsula. Silent Jack, Vancouver, Washington, across the river from Portland. Michaela, Tri-Cities, thank you. Way over here. And Jordan, Seattle, thank you. Where are you from, Hope? Portland, got it. Okay, right. So that's our distribution. And we're going here today. So part of the reason for doing that was just to get us set up with geography. Most of us are not good with map reading, map making certainly, but even map reading. So this is our state of Washington. This is Ellensburg, somewhere in here. I've already forgotten here, I guess. And here's Interstate 90 going up and over the mountains, past Emily II's house at Easton, 
and then continuing over to the Seattle area. Why does this peninsula exist? What do we know about the peninsula? Don't answer that. I'm just trying to do our field method approach first, collecting data, and then we go. Now remember, what have we done the last two sessions? We were talking about the Cascades. Those are cones, cone-shaped volcanoes in the Cascades. I'll make little puffy ash things if you want. Remember our four volcanic products? Our lahars and our ash flow tufts and everything else? So that's our volcanic arc. You remember that? The Cascade Volcanic Arc. Arc means line. And we have this line of active volcanoes. We talked about what active means last time. Okay, we're leaving the Cascade Volcanic Arc. That was the last two lectures. We go through the Seattle metropolitan area. We cross water of Puget Sound. We cross the Seattle Fault. We cross the Puget Lobe glacial stuff. And then this is a mountain range, isn't it? Like if you're in downtown Seattle at the, at the, uh, the Pike Street Market or uh, Mariner's Game and you're up on the third deck and you're enjoying a nice ice cold beer and you're looking west, you're looking west across the water of Puget Sound, there's a whole nother mountain range there. I, I would guess that many, especially out of town visitors, assume that's the Cascades. They're looking west to big mountains with snow and ice on them, and they just go, I don't know, I guess that's Rainier or Cascades or volcanoes or something. Why is that mountain range there? And can I do this? Can I put some active volcanoes on the Olympic Peninsula? Well, I don't know. Let's go there and make some notes. Here is the bedrock geology of the Olympic Peninsula. And it kind of continues, doesn't not really though, but I'll let you know that Vancouver Island is across the Strait of Juan de Fuca uh, in, in Canada, in British Columbia. But we're mo mostly focusing on uh, the Olympic Peninsula here. Let me ask if that. I need some room to write. Here is the bedrock geology of the Olympic Peninsula. There's a lot of sandstone over there. There's a lot of shale over there. Are those sedimentary, igneous, or metamorphic rocks? Sedimentary, thank you for being awake. Sandstone is sedimentary. Shale is sedimentary. You've seen both of them in the lab across the way, right? Slate is the metamorphic equivalent of taking shale and adding temperature and pressure. I'm reminding you of this. We've already talked about it. And for this lecture today, that's it. That's it for the lecture today. Now, we'll be back to the Olympic Peninsula tomorrow to get a little bit fancy, to transition to something else. But right now, I want to focus on the fact that we have these kinds of rocks in beautiful layers, but the layers are very complicated. So I'm going to add, can you read that? That says reverse faults. So not only do we have a bunch of sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, sandstones, shales, and slates on the Olympic Peninsula, but we can see that they are heavily faulted. And the faults are reverse faults. So I don't know if I want to do this. Yeah, why not? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put a bunch of faults on this map for you. I guess I'll erase this in a second. But right now, I just want to emphasize that uh, the Olympic Peninsula is no Grand Canyon. It's, it's no beautiful horizontal layers of sandstone that stretch as far as the eye can see. The layers are much younger than the Grand Canyon. I'm spitballing now. Even though the bedrock layers are far younger than exposed in the Grand Canyon, they are heavily faulted and offset and broken. You remember all our relative age dating problems? It's a mess. It's a heavily contorted, altered, screwed up place. Now, 
now that I've told you that it's kind of youngish rocks that have been heavily faulted, I should give you some ages. I do need to clean up now a little bit. So these sandstone slates and shales of the Olympic Peninsula are younger than 40 million years. Take good notes now. That's all I'm giving you. That date is talking about the age of the bedrock on the Olympic Peninsula. Now, 40. That's a familiar number from last couple of sessions. What did we use for 40? Or why did we say 40 million years the last couple of lectures? Mm. Mason? Uh, you guys are going a step further than I want. Why, why was 40 important for the last two lectures? Jordan? It's about the volcanic cones in the Cascades. Didn't I say that the Cascades began 40 million years ago? Uh, again, I think you're, you're, you're going a little farther than I want, and that's great, but I just want to be nice and simple right so, so far. The Cascade volcanoes have a 40 million year history. You remember, remember this now. The game of whack-a-mole. These cones pop up, and they're only there for 2 million years at a time, and then they erode away, remember? But I said that there was no Cascade volcanic arc until about 40 million years ago, and we have had this line of active volcanoes for the last 40 million years. Once again, the Cascades have a 40 million year history. Now, it's not an accident that the bedrock on the Olympic Peninsula starts about 40 million years ago. But it's not 40 million years ago. It's far younger than 40 million years. And you'll see why I'm emphasizing that in just a second. So, so far, what's our data? Sandstones, shales, slates, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks that, were, uh, that are younger than 40 million years old. We're not ready to handle it today, but tomorrow we will try to address why the volcanic arc of the Cascades and the bedrock of the Olympic Peninsula both start about 40 million years ago. Basically, why don't we have cascades going back to the beginning of time? Why do the cascade volcanoes start 40 million years ago? That's, again, from the last, from last week, but let's, let's sound like a weird statement to say. What do you mean there weren't any cascade volcanoes 50 million years ago? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, why? Got to come tomorrow for that answer. Okay. There are no volcanic rocks on the Olympic Peninsula in today's lecture. I stumbled because I'm already thinking about how I want to word this properly. These rocks that are younger than 40 million years ago on the Olympic Peninsula are not lavas. They're not pyroclastic flows. They're not lahars. And so I had this picture of a volcano with some steaming ash coming out of it. And I want to get that out. There is no volcanic history with Mount Olympus. Have you heard of Mount Olympus? That's the highest point on the Olympic Peninsula. I'll have some beautiful photos for you that I just found this morning sitting in my chair. Like I should find some new images of Mount Olympus. I found some good ones. Mount Olympus is the high point of Olympic National Park. Mount Olympus is the high point within the guts, within the center of the Olympic Peninsula. It ain't a volcano, baby. It never was. It never will be. There's no chance of Mount Olympus erupting because it's made out of freaking shale, slate, and sandstone. It's sedimentary. Okay. Good energy. Let's pick up the pace. There's something called the Big Three. And uh, let's see. Let's keep this board kind of within sight. Really... I'm really trying some new stuff this morning. We'll see if it works. Uh, yeah. I want to keep the Olympic Peninsula and this volcanic arc visible to you. But I also want to do some drawing here. All right. So we know the tectonic scene. How have I drawn it before? Like this, right? We know that the Cascade Volcanic Arc 
is, this is old news to us. This is an oceanic plate called the Juan de Fuca plate, subducting beneath a continental North American plate. That's old news. And we know that we truly do have composite cone volcanoes in a line called the Cascades. We were up there the last two days. St. Helens, Rainier, et cetera. So what's the big three? The big three includes a feature that I have purposely ignored until this morning. It was always there, I just chose to ignore it. I didn't think it was necessary for us until now. Here we go. Anytime you have a convergent oceanic versus continental plate boundary worldwide, you form the big three. You form three physiographic regions Boom, 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 right next to each other. And the volcanic arc, I'm not flipping you off, although I think I am. The volcanic arc is just one of those three features. But if you can find the big three, you know that this is the picture tectonically. If you can find, get that in your notes somehow, that's the, one of the biggest messages of today. If you can find the big three, haven't even said what they are yet, but if you can find this holy trinity, these three things, boom, 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 right next to each other, including a volcanic arc, you know that this is the plate tectonic situation, which is what? A convergent oceanic versus continental plate boundary. You've got that statement. That's the importance of the big three. So what is it? The big three, I'll list them here, is an accretionary wedge. Oh, boy. That sounds hard. It's not. We'll talk about it. Number two, a four-arc basin, and three, a volcanic arc. I'm defining for you what the big three is. We just said why it's important. And I'm going to draw for you the big three here in just a second. What's the big three? It's these three things laid out next to each other. The accretionary wedge, the four-arc basin, and the volcanic arc. Okay, well, let's do it. I just emphasize to you that if you go... to Seattle which is here on the map. You go to Seattle, you have mountain ranges on both sides of you. It's not just the Cascades. It's not just the Cascade volcanoes that are visible on a clear day from Seattle. There's a whole nother mountain range to the west of Seattle. And that's what we just decided was the Olympic Peninsula. That's what we just decided was sandstones, shales, and slates that are heavily faulted or interrupted by reverse faults. And that's an accretionary wedge. The Olympic Peninsula is our accretionary wedge. Number one of the big three is the topic today. An accretionary wedge. I'll do it on the map too if you want. One, two, Three, which you can barely read. So let's finish it up and pick out the pace. The Olympic Peninsula is the accretionary wedge. The Seattle area, Tacoma, many of your hometowns, are in what's called the Four Arc Basin. It's a basin. It's a valley. It's a broad lowland. And then number three, the volcanic arc, as we already know that, that's the Cascades. So one, two, three, accretionary wedge, four arc basin is the Puget Lowland, and volcanic arc is number three, the Cascades. The point is, we've ignored, number one, we've ignored this thing called an accretionary wedge, sometimes called a subduction complex, until today. Why do we care? Well, the Olympic Peninsula is a pretty significant part of our state, number one. We, sh we should include it if we're focusing on the state of Washington. But you'll see in, moment, in just a few moments that we will also be able to understand other areas of North America better 
if we understand the concept of a big three. I'm feeling like I want to gamble. What does a big three tell us? If we find a big three in Russia, what do we know? Hope? Beautifully done. Hope. Hope says, if we find a big three, there is or there was a convergent oceanic versus continental plate boundary. Beautifully done. Okay, well, you have this in the yellow book a diagram that I made before I moved to Ellensburg, Washington. I, this is long ago, in other words. Otherwise, I would have put Ellensburg on the frickin' thing. So this is 39. Thirty-nine is a map, Western Washington. So I was teaching in Ohio, and I was teaching about the big three in an accretionary wedge. I called it a subduction complex on this page, but I now like the term accretionary wedge better than subduction complex. And so far, I've shown you basically the setup that I just gave you, 39. Okay, it's time to pick up the pace. We're done with our field data for right now. Who wants to brainstorm with me, just briefly? Why do you think that accretionary wedge forms if it's not a volcano? Like, why are we getting this huge mountain range called the Olympic Peninsula and Mount Olympus if it's not a volcano? Like, how, how are we making that stuff? Anybody want to guess, based on a, a couple clues I have on page 39? Anybody want to try? I can plow ahead if you want, but it, give it a try. It involves a brand new idea for us. Hope's kind of, uh, sorry, Tawny's kind of got her hand up. You want to try, Tawny? Why not? That's a great start. Thank you. So, so Tawny's thinking, is, is the sediment kind of building up in one spot? And the answer is yes. Where do we think the sediment might be coming from? Mason. The soft sediment on the ocean. That's the clue that's on page 39. So on 39, you can see carefully uh, that I have labeled the top of the Juan de Fuca plate. I've labeled the top of the Juan de Fuca plate, and I've called it soft sediment. So obviously the whole plate, the ocean plate, is not soft sediment, but I'm saying that there is soft sediment, or I'll use a phrase that you know, deep sea sediment. You remember that stuff? Remember our 33 glacials and interglacials way back in January when we were so young? God, life was so simple back then. Not really. So the concept we want is that, yes, we have this rather large, not large in a global sense, but large for us, a large oceanic plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, that's coming at us. Do you need it labeled? I guess I can do it for you. We know that's the Juan de Fuca coming at it, not the Pacific. And here is all of this soft sediment, this deep sea sediment, these layers of mud, essentially, that are sitting offshore. This is exciting now. Isn't that nice when somebody tells you when something's exciting? It's like, I'll decide if it's exciting or not, jackass. All right. The question is, what happens to the soft sediment as it approaches the oceanic trench. Does the soft sediment go down the subducting plate with, sorry, does the soft sediment go down with the subducting plate? Remember, this is Brian Atwater country. This is the locked unlock zone. This is where we're getting every 500 years, the magnitude nine quakes. And yet we're introducing a healthy amount of mud that's riding passively on the surface of this ocean floor, and here it comes. So what's the connection then between the soft sediment on the ocean plate and this Olympic Peninsula? Who can put those two concepts together for us? I've set you up. Who can do it for us? Hope. Go for it. Yep. That's it. You're right on the mark. Good job. Whatever you had for breakfast, keep going with it. It's working for you. Hope can see it. Maybe many of you can see it. Let's make sure we can all see it. 
What is the Olympic Peninsula? What is an accretionary wedge? It's accumulated sediment from a different plate. This is a big moment for us. We're taking something from one tectonic plate and shifting it onto another plate. I'm pausing for dramatic effect, baby, because we're going to be doing nothing but this for the next week. What did we just do? We talked about the concept that something on one plate can get transferred from one tectonic plate to the edge of another one. In this case, it's just a bunch of mud. It's just a bunch of soft sediment. I have a couple animations that will help, maybe one. I have one good animation that will help, but I'll try here in case you don't, still don't see what we're doing. If I put this in motion, like hit play on the chalkboard and have this thing start to animate, that'd be cool. Maybe I should find somebody to do that for us. If I do that and put this in motion, there's no room for this mud. There's no room for this mud. This is a, a permanently, mm, this is a place that, where the two plates are locked. And they're not slipping at all. So there's just, we can slip the ocean plate beneath but the boundary is locked. There's no room for this mud to go down the, down the tubes. And so this stuff is going to start accumulating. This is like shoveling snow. You're coming down the sidewalk. Your snow blade, your shovel blade is coming right. That's nice, wet, Midwestern snow. And this snow is just accumulating in this huge accretionary wedge. And the further you go down the side, we're going to go all the way down to Mrs. Erdman's. That's the... Gal that I used to have to shovel for at 5.30 in the morning back in Wisconsin. Seemed unfair at the time. I'm glad I did it now. Shoveling snow. The more we have subduction, the more sediment we are scraping off of the ocean plate and the more sediment we are adding to the edge of the North American plate. And so when we look at an accretionary wedge, of course it's going to be complicated. Of course it's going to have a bunch of reverse faults. Reverse faults tell us compression. And we're constantly shoving new sediment into this pile, violating often, oh boy, here's a throwback, violating often the rule of superposition. Anybody remember what the superposition law was in the first week of class back in January when we weren't even in the same room together? Eve. Eve. If you got a bunch of flat rock layers, like in the Grand Canyon, the superposition law says the, le the oldest one is at the bottom and the youngest one is at the top. Very good. That doesn't work here. First of all, these layers aren't flat. They're heavily folded and faulted. But number two, we're doing something unusual here. We're, we're, it's almost like we're shoving new stuff into the bottom of the pile. And, and you kind of do that with a, a snow shovel as well. Okay, we feeling Okay. This is a set of ideas that are, I don't think they're that hard, but they set us up beautifully for the rest of the week. So even Mount Olympus, you can see now why Mount Olympus is not a volcano and never was. It's just a, it's the top of the garbage pile. It's the top of the stuff that just got accumulated. And yes, the Olympic Peninsula is still building because we still have this process at work. Questions? The big three, do you see it? Accretionary wedge, four arc basin, volcanic arc. Basically, we now know why number one and number three form, and number two, a four arc basin is just a passive lowland between these two active mountain ranges. Tim. Yep, sandstone. Yes, but we're not ready. That's tomorrow. Good job. Uh, Tim's wondering about more than just mud coming in from the ocean, and uh, he's, he's a little ahead of us there. Others? Mason? So, Hope mentioned that we would know that it either has or used to have an ocean versus continental convergent boundary. Correct. And I don't know exactly how long this... Um, Subduction complex is going to last, but once the water from the plate is fully subducted, is it just going to disappear with erosion, or what 
Mason's thinking about the future, and he's saying, so if we get rid of the Juan de Fuca plate, as we discussed, then uh, would the Olympic Peninsula go away? And the answer is yes. There'd be no process to build that any longer, just like there won't be any process to actively make magma beneath the volcanic arc. So we'll lose both of those ranges, and we're, that's where we're headed, essentially, is looking to the future here a little bit. Thank you very much. Oh, my God, this guy's gone off the deep end. He's showing a photo of himself. This is from our last session. And I don't know if anybody remembers this photo that I showed, but it was looking at the Osceola mud flow, and I was, uh, I just, it was like a second, probably. And I've shown that photo for probably 25 years. And I... I'm not, I'm not happy to say this. I say the same little quip every time I show that photo. I say, here's a hippie for scale. You maybe you remember me saying that. Well, you know, we're live streaming. So I heard from the hippie. Got an email from the hippie like two hours after we were done on Friday. This is a totally cool perk of doing this live streaming thing. So I never knew who that hippie was, and it's kind of demeaning to even say it that way. But he, here's, here's his email. Uh, Nick, I'm the hippie in, in the photo. Brian Drost, hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm retired now. I was much younger in the photo. You might pass on to your students that being a geology major resulted in a pretty good and interesting life. A bachelor's degree in geology from Binghamton in New York State. A master's degree in geology from University of Pennsylvania resulted in a 30-year career with the U.S. doing challenging and rewarding work and the pay was pretty good too. So uh, that builds on me trying to get you to become geology majors. Thanks, Brian, for the email and uh, a fun little way to uh, put a bow on that. Okay, um, you can find the Olympic Peninsula on this beautiful raised relief map. There's a lot of good imagery now, a lot of good maps going on. This is our topic today. It's an accretionary wedge, sister. It's an accretionary wedge. The volcanic arc is here, the Cascades. Ellensburg, Kittitas Valley, this cute little valley right here. That'd be a cool place to live, wouldn't it? In a valley like right next to the Cascades and there'd be all this geology in all parts of the state. Yeah. Page 39 looks like this. This is what Mount Olympus looks like. GPS instruments, you remember those? Installed by our guys upstairs. They got up to the top of Mount Olympus and just the logistics to get up there and install that stuff and to get the solar panels and everything else. So that's just one of the hundreds of GPS stations showing our clockwise rotation. But this is usually only the photo that I've shown about Olympus. And I always felt like, ah, I should find some more photos. So as I was having some coffee this morning, I just got on the uh, internet. Uh, I don't have credits on these photos, sorry. So this guy, I don't know. But is he standing on andesite lava, in a volcanic lahar? No, he's not. He's on top of Mount Olympus on a clear day. And his website, or he's part of some website called Pacific Alpine Guide. So I was very impressed by just a simple Google search to find these climbing sites, guided trips, multi-day type things. And my favorite that I found uh, about an hour ago was uh, something I'd never heard of, Miss Adventure Pants. Misadventure Pants, uh, and she has a really nice series of slides to kind of walk you up the multi-day multi approach into the guts of the Olympic Peninsula, and um, the, I don't know if, she, if Sarah is the owner or uh, if she's the lead guide or whatever, but uh, very impressed with what they have put together, what she has put together on the website. So let me just share some of her photos uh, about Maybe a trip that you could do if you wanted to, if you have some climbing experience. I don't know what they re recommend or require for you to join, probably dollars. <laughs> so anyway, many of you know that down low on the, on the fringes on the west side of Olympic Peninsula is, you know, it's, there's no snow and ice. It's, it's rainforest. And then before too long, if the weather's got a nice, you know, high pressure system or something, you can get up into this rugged country in the interior. Very remote, very rugged, thanks to land set aside more than a, a, a half a century ago. And here's just one of their trips, um, mountaineering up to the summit of Mount Olympus. 
Anybody rock climb in here? Tim does. Nobody else? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really growing thing. You're talking to an old, you're listening to an old person now. Uh, I didn't know many rock climbers back in the day. And all these remote geology sites that I would visit regularly, there's nobody out there. Well, now suddenly there's rock climbers everywhere, which is a good thing because I've always had great experiences just walking up to some group and they're all super positive people and they, and they love being outdoors. And we don't even talk about geology. They don't know I'm a geologist. They were just talking about the, where they're from and the, the, over to Frenchman Cooley or wherever else. So it's a and, you know, climbing gyms in the Cirque, and that's right. It's, it's been a great thing to see develop in the last 20 years. Um, so here's an example. So if you have some of those climbing skills, all of my kids are rock climbers now. I'm not much into it. What are they sitting on? What kind of rocks? Slate? What else? Shale? Sandstone, right. So the shale, so the mud, in case I didn't say it, I don't think I did, that soft mud on the ocean floor gets crammed into the bottom of the accretionary wedge. The mud converts to shale. We add more temperature and pressure. The shale gets converted to slate. We add more temperature and pressure as we continue to cram it into this pile of snow, basically. You know what I mean. And then the sand is another story, which I don't think I want to dwell on, but there's plenty of sandstone out there as well. Good. Okay, so back to Geology 101 textbook land. Um, that's, they're showing this complicated accretionary wedge, and there's our volcanic arc, which has a very different origin. They're choosing to show sea level very high, so it doesn't work for Washington, but I just want you to see the difference between showing a complicated, very near trench. That's the other thing, in case you didn't catch it. This is a mountain range forming very close to the trench. We're right next door to the, uh, uh, subduction zone and the trench. And for a long time, it was very difficult to explain why you would have a mountain range that's non-volcanic. I mean, it, let's just step away for a second. This is a subduction zone. You would assume, wouldn't you, if it's a subduction zone, that, the, that we have volcanoes. And we do, but we have to be far enough inland to generate the magma. We can't come up with a way to generate a lot of magma near a trench unless we get very fancy, which we're not doing here in Geology 101 land. This is the animation clip I wanted to show you from the IRIS YouTube channel. And they're showing a bunch of other things. They're showing us the lock zone. We don't care about that today. Those are the great earthquakes. But Genda uh, has shown us this yellow. The yellow is our deep sea sediments. It's our mud. And yeah, Tim, we got some other pimples out there that we're ignoring today. But it's just, I put this on a loop. So it's just, is that what you visualized as I was trying to activate my chalkboard looking for the play button? Um, it's just, as we continue to subduct the ocean plate, we continue to accrete or accumulate, I'll just say uh, accumulate a bunch of material. And of course, we're way above sea level with the Olympic Peninsula. On this thing, which we've seen a million times, we really don't have much of an accretionary wedge, but you can see even they are trying to give us a sense that we're accumulating this sediment right down there at the trench. Skip it. This poster that I showed you before is really amazing. I, that's one of the things that really catches my eye, maybe yours too. You can show uh, with Cindy, Cynthia's poster uh, how much material has accumulated. I love the way she's done that artistically. Accretionary wedge, we got it now. Now, let me just take a break from this. I want to do this quickly because I only have uh, eight minutes left. You've got page 33. Can you turn to it, please? Page 33, the mother of all pages in the yellow book. Page 33, which will be needed for tomorrow's quiz. Page 33, which you will draw from scratch on the final exam. Page 33, dog. If you recall, one of the main messages from page 33 was saying that there used to be a huge ocean plate subducting beneath California. Remember? Remember? 40 million years ago, there was no San Andreas Fault. And 40 million years ago, there was a huge ocean plate subducting beneath California. And page 33 tells us that today, 
most of California no longer has a Farallon plate subducting. Instead, the San Andreas Fault is operating. So some of you are ahead of me. I know you are. And that's a great thing this late in the quarter. This is one of my favorite old school maps that I have in my office. And I took it down of my office just a second ago to bring it in here with you. Look at the state of California. This is not a geologic map. This is a topographic map showing uh, elevations. Can you see the outline of California here? This is California, right? Now, most other states have kind of one or maybe two colors in it. The browns are higher elevations. The, the, the green is very low elevation. But look at California. I'm really going to zoom in here. California has all the colors. And California has this incredible great valley, a central valley or the great valley of California. And there's a less impressive mountain range along the coast of California and a bigger mountain range in eastern California called the Sierra Nevada Mountains. What evidence do we have that 40 million years ago, there used to be the Farallon Plate subduct beneath the state of California, where that's not happening today. What evidence do we have? Hope. You got it. We're looking at the big three. It's staring you right in the frickin' face. Spladam. And yet there is no subduction anymore in the state of California. Can you see it? That's powerful. Because we know that the big three tell us one very specific plate boundary type. Again, the big three only forms in a convergent oceanic versus continental plate boundary. You want it a different way? You need subduction to make the big three. And today we don't have subduction, except for extremely north California. And so here you can see the entire state of California screaming at you from a map view. There used to be subduction of the Farallon plate here. And I'm showing you why. Because we have, Mason, hang on, because we have an accretionary wedge at the coast, a four arc basin down the middle, and a volcanic arc in the east. Let me give you, oh, daddy's arm's getting tired. Let me give you the names that I would like to use in California to link up. In fact, I'll do it in Washington first to make sure we've got it. The big three in Washington, what are they? Number one, Olympic Peninsula. Number two, Puget Sound. Number three, Cascades. That's the big three, right? One, two, three, Olympic Peninsula, Puget Sound, Cascades. You know what I'm doing. And now I want to use place names in California to show the big three down there, which is obviously older. Coast Range of California, that's what we'll call number one in California, Coast Range. Great Valley is number two. Great Valley of California is the Four Arc Basin. And number three in California, the Volcanic Arc, which is dead is the Sierra Nevada range. Have you heard of the Sierra Nevadas before? The Sierra Nevada mountain range. The Sierra Nevada pale ale. One, two, three in California. Coast range, Great Valley, Sierras. What can we say about the difference between the big three in California versus the big three in Washington? Well, our big three are still active. They're still alive. We still have eruptions, the last two lectures. We still have the Olympic Peninsula growing. The big three in California dead. Well, what does that mean? Dead, page 30, page 40. God, we're almost to the end of the yellow book. I guess we're in the home stretch of the class. I got one minute and we're going to finish with this diagram on page 40. Page 40 is trying to show California's big three when it was alive at the top of page 40, and when it died, when the big three in California died, the bottom half of page 40. Again, I did this long ago. What are we looking at? Well, there's a top of page 40. 
that's a convergent oceanic versus plate bound, convert. That's a convergent oceanic versus continental plate boundary, correct? And notice the timing on this. That's earlier than 20 million years ago. Who's with me? Who remembers what happened 20 million years ago in California? The birth of the San Andreas Fault. Hope, you get the gold star today. So there is no San Andreas Fault earlier than 20 million years ago, and we have the big three still being active. I should have probably put a four-arc ba four basin in here and an accretionary wedge. I didn't. You might want to put that in if you really want to be thorough about that. That's my bad. And yeah, it's the oceanic Farallon plate that's our evidence. But now look what happens in our last minute today. Look at what happens on the bottom of page 40 when we kill the big three. First of all, we kill the big three because we no longer have the Farallon plate subducting. And you're like, why? And the answer is page 33. Right? We already know why. North America crosses the East Pacific Rise. So we had the Farallon plate subducting starting 20 million years ago. We suddenly have the Pacific plate subducting. Wrong. Sorry. In the last 20 million years, we have the Pacific plate nearby, but it's not subducting. It's the San Andreas. You want to put something else in here? Let's put the San Andreas Fault on this boundary. Thank you. Most of you are still engaged. This is a transform plate boundary. San Andreas on my fingertip right here between the Pacific and the North American plate. I promise I'm almost done. So if we kill the subduction zone, we solidify the magma. It becomes granite. The volcano stops erupting. And the last thing I'll say is some pretty young action on the normal faults in the area has uplifted the magma chamber bedrock and if you uplift, you intensify erosion, and so suddenly we have a ghost volcano on our hands. And we actually get finally to an explanation for why we had those X's in California showing ghost volcanoes that you might have on page 33. That was rushed right at the end, and there was some good stuff there, so we will start very quickly with more of this and a couple more slides before we transition to Celestia after quiz number three tomorrow. First 10 minutes tomorrow, that's you taking quiz number three. The rest of tomorrow, that's me talking about Celestia. Thank you for coming. I love you. Goodbye. We do. We do. Uh, but it's underwater. The, the, the accretionary wedge is underwater in ocean versus ocean scene. Very good, Mason. Mean that at some point the, uh, the mountain range of California are just going to let it go, right? Yeah. Um, you would think so, JC. However, that normal fault, which is kind of mysterious uh, for you, is actively lifting that Sierra Nevada block. And so there's actually some action today, not from subduction, that's actually lifting that Sierra range. So uh, I don't think it will totally just, that, that mountain range will totally go away anytime soon. Okay. Yeah, very good. Bryce. Very evident in the Oregon coastline. There isn't much of a area. It does continue into Oregon, the Willamette, of course, the Four Arc Basin, but you're right, south of Eugene, it kind of goes away. Is that what you're asking about? Right, right. Yeah, uh, I'll get to your live Q and A in just a second. Bryce is here asking about, you know, why don't we have green all the way down? In other words, why don't we have a nice, consistent four arc basin all the way down? It's a good question. Uh, I think this is a clockwise rotation story, where we may have had a four arc basin continue uh, going all the way through, but we have since. Uh, closed it and deformed it, but I, I'm not entirely positive that's the story. Thank you. Let's see if anybody else wants to chat, and then we'll get to you. Uh, last thing, Mason. I just wanted to let you know that I might not be here on Thursday. I'm heading over the pass tomorrow after class. Okay. And my goal is to come back Wednesday, but you know how stuff sometimes is there. So I just wanted to let you know. And then okay. I was also going to say for the final. 
is the final going to be more based specifically on this last sort of stretch or will it be more uh, wide first day of class to today as finals often are a uh, little of both little of both. we'll talk about it on thursday let's just wait till then whether you see it on the live stream or in person okay okay thank you and i do plan on being here in person okay hi jordan Thanks, um, I did the silver this weekend, but I yeah. didn't know what to put for here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we didn't. Uh, I didn't film there, so just leave that blank. And you did the stop two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are those yeah. ready to be turned in? Do you yeah. Think? Okay, I can just take them from you. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm good. So you got the Thorpe. You have got Manash Tash. A Yakima Canyon, both of them, and you have Manash Tash. Nice job. Hey. All set. Thank you. <sighs> okay, Jordan's packing up. She's taking off. She just turned in the rest of her lab stuff. Uh, I do have a few minutes this morning if you want to stick around and ask a few questions. Um, you know the drill by now. We do a little live Q&A, uppercase for your questions. And uh, ex experienced uh, people of the live stream know that Celestia is part of the Olympic Peninsula story, but you notice that I purposely avoided it today. So any questions about Celestia, I'm going to ignore because we're going to talk about it tomorrow. Okay, let me scroll back till I start seeing some live, uh, uh, some uppercase. Uh Tavetti, does Baja BC have anything to do with the Great Valley in California, or is it just Four Arc Basin? Uh, thanks for the question. So I don't think I'm going to get it into it with these guys, but um, those that were with us in the live stream series called Exotic Terrains A to Z, uh, especially in late November and early December, we started looking carefully at this old idea that the Farallon plate has always been subducting uh, beneath California to create the big three as I discussed here today. But if we go back much earlier than the time frame I was talking about today, uh, there are some significant problems with that very simple model that was first put together by Bill Dickinson. Um, and Warren Hamilton also. Uh, so that old, you know, many of you are geology people and you were taught 40 years ago, maybe even as much as 50 years ago, that there has always been a Farallon plate subduction beneath California to create the big three, as I've discussed today. But there's newer evidence now to suggest it wasn't that simple and that the Farallon plate was not always just coming at Washington as I presented today. So I have to say that to, to address your question of Baja BC, which we will talk about with these guys. I, I still don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, just, I've just kind of blown up this portion of the class. And I'm going to try to, to use the greatest hits of the exotic terrain live stream and, and see if I can do it at this level. So they will be introduced to Baja BC. Um, and so that's a long way of saying that... Uh, Uh, especially the Franciscan complex in the accretionary wedge of California has a more controversial origin than it used to. Let's leave it like that. Is Vancouver Island part of the wedge? Well, again, I, I, uh, I, I've made great strides in learning exotic terrain geology uh, history. Since September... And you might have noticed that I, I, I had Vancouver Island on here for a second because I used to teach that this, this Olympic Peninsula story just continues over to the, Olymp, uh, to the Vancouver Island. I know not, that's not the case at all. There's a Rangelia story, which is a large igneous province that's totally different than Celestia, which is a different large igneous province. So the short answer is no, you just can't continue that story uh, into BC, but I, I did that on autopilot before I even thought, like, wait a minute, I, I now know about the uh, Vancouver Island, and it's not this story at all. 
So if you're curious about Vancouver Island, it involves some exotic terrains that uh, I discussed in the live stream, and I guess I'll have to send you back there. And you're like, how do I find that? Well, you just go to my YouTube channel. I guess you're on it now. And just, you can go uh, scroll down. If you get all the videos to pop up that I've done in the last year, just, just scroll down. You'll get past this summer stuff, and then you'll, you'll get a bunch of live streams called Nick from Home and Exotic Terrains. Oh, let's do a few more. Trying to find, I don't know where I am now. Uh, Justin, has Southern Oregon, Northern California lost its accretionary wedge? Oh, Justin, that's just what uh, Bryce asked about. And it might be a function of the way that they colored this map, but it is kind of impressive that there's a beautiful four arc basin, number two of the big three in California. And same for the Puget Lowland heading down to the Willamette Valley. I think you heard what I said to Bryce. Possibly this four arc basin was continuous. And possibly that four arc basin has been closed and mangled because of the clockwise rotation that we've had. Remember, there's a lot of GPS in here showing a tremendous movement uh, with the clockwise rotation. But I don't think that's a totally uh, complete answer. And I don't know the actual full answer to address that kind of missing four arc basin in Northern California. I've always meant to look into it, just haven't gotten there. It's too young, I think, for the stuff I've been looking at lately. Uh, George, the Kitsap Peninsula and Olympic Peninsula, I don't know what that word is. Yeah, uh, I would think of them as the same. But the Kitsap Peninsula, uh, that's more of a Celestia story that we'll learn tomorrow. The Crescent, if you're puzzled, I'm gonna, I've saved the Crescent Formation, if you know about it, and Celestia till tomorrow which is volcanic. Virgil, did the North American plate crashing into the exotic terrains create the Rocky Mountains? Um, we will not get to the Rocky Mountains for sure in this class because I continue to be completely confused about the Rocky Mountains. I used to teach about the Rocky Mountains, but it was such a simple, embarrassingly simple plate tectonic model that I stopped because I think it's wrong. And uh, I'm probably doing some live streams this spring now, uh, I might be talking about the Rockies a little bit this spring. There's a teaser. Uh, I, Joni, I will show some pictures from Owens Valley, uh, I guess tomorrow, to finish up today's stuff. I used to teach a field class in Owens Valley every September. Central kids, we'd drive them all the way down in four vans uh, two weeks in September, a required part of our program that still exists, but uh, I've stopped doing it. Some younger faculty are teaching it now. Yes, the Long Valley Caldera is there. Yes, there's some very active magma beneath that supervolcano site. Um, and there's the big pine volcanic field, and there's a lot of very young volcanism here. None of that's related to our story today, however. It's way too young. Curtis, I don't know. Any, the first thing about the Ozarks, I'm sorry. Uh, all I know is that it's somehow related to the Appalachians. Papagino, will clockwise rotation cause Puget Sound to close? Oh, um, interesting. I guess to answer that, we'd need to really decide how much more rotation there will be, like how much more millions of years. The words are a little, I can't make my mouth work this morning very well. It's one of those days. Um, and to explain how much longer we'll have clockwise rotation, involves how much longer we'll have the current ocean plates doing their thing offshore? I guess the answer is yes, but I don't really have much more to say than that. Thank you. Minna in Finland. Uh, Olympia growing and uplifting equals erosion accelerating. Which one is faster? So is Olympia getting higher or no? 
Interesting thought. If you're, if Minna, if you're thinking about the cycle of uh, uplift and subsidence at the coast, that's such a tiny little cycle of uplift and subsidence with the great earthquakes and the lock zone unlocked. It's such a tiny thing compared to this massive mountain range. I don't have the geodetic information in my head that would answer your question about the rate of overall tectonic lifting of the Olympic Peninsula. And even if I did, those would be measurements really in the last century at tops if you use like benchmarks and other things. Uh, so I, I don't really know who's winning the battle right now. It's a surprisingly complicated issue. There's still some isostatic rebound from the Puget Lobe ice sheet, I think. I don't know, it's on my list. I always get questions along those lines, but I, I, I don't know how to answer that very well. Uh, are there marine fossils in Mount Olympus? That's an excellent question. Sharon or Sharon? Um, I don't know. I, I guess there must be at the microscopic level, if we have these deep sea sediments, you could think of them as being composed of these foraminifera, let's say. So in the microscopic level, I, I guess it's all deep sea ocean sediments. So at the microscopic level, it should be nothing but ocean creatures. But I think you're probably asking about visible shells and things like that. And I, I don't think so, but I, I don't know. I've never been... I've never been into the interior of the Olympic Peninsula, and I guess most people have not. I do have some photos lined up of Yosemite. Uh, that will be part of tomorrow. So we'll have a little spillover with the slides that I didn't get to today, so just a little bit from Eastern California. Um, Dwayne, I've never found a good answer. I've wondered that myself a long time. Dwayne, Dwayne asks, what is the heat source for the hot springs on the Olympic Peninsula? I don't know. I don't get it. I think I, I've been asked that, I don't know how many times over the last 30 years, and I, I've never found an answer. Maybe somebody here can email me something. But I, great question, I don't know. Northwest Lifer, will subduction end when the Juan de Fuca is fully subducted? Yes, I think that's the way to view it. That's the way I've always taught it. Um, I guess there's a possible reconfiguration of the ocean plates offshore when and if North America overrides the rest of the Juan de Fuca Ridge. I guess it's possible that kind of dead Pacific plate would then begin subducting, but I'm just starting to think seriously again about the configuration of different ocean plates and which directions they were moving offshore. And that's going to be one of the main focuses of the next batch of new programs from me as it impacts things here in the Pacific Northwest. But currently, I don't know much. I'm going down to live. We'll do three more, and we'll, we'll, I think we're done today. Lightning Strike says there's really great fossil crabs found in the concretions on the Olympic Peninsula. Well, there's a whole other issue. Concretions just generally confuse me. Obviously, I'm not much of a paleontology person, but I think most of you know what I'm talking about. You have this kind of this mud ball that's kind of hard rock, like a shale mud ball, and then you crack it with a hammer and you open it and there's this beautiful crab on the inside or some kind of marine organism. Uh, I've always heard explanations of those things, but that I don't really, I don't really understand. And then is that tens of millions of years ago? Is there any way to date those concretions? I would think it's pretty young, but what do I know? Yeah, we're getting close to the ocean. Once we get, I'm from, you know, I'm corn fed, man. I'm from Wisconsin. I don't know anything about the ocean. I enjoy visiting the ocean, but I always feel like I am definitely a long way from home. <laughs> and some of you are ocean people. You know the ocean's uh, like the back of your hand. And you would feel similarly if you were in the, uh, uh, glacial drumlin in Wisconsin. 
Two more. Dave uh, says, it's not clear why the four arc basin is required. Why can't the volcanic arc be next to the accretionary wedge? Well, I don't know, Dave. I mean, uh, you go around the world, you look at accretionary wedges that are currently being created. Let's say um, you go to any, go to South America, a classic place where you have subducting ocean plate. You have an accretionary wedge there. Probably much of it's still below sea level. I don't, I don't really know. And there's always a, I think there's always a basin to cross before you get to the arc. I don't, I don't really see. Are there any places today where there's a one and a three right next to each other? I don't know the answer, but Kodiak Island, for instance, is a number one, an accretionary wedge, and then you cross through a basin, you get to the Aleutian Arc. I don't know enough global examples to know, but I, I'm not quite sure why you're uh, really wanting to get rid of a four arc basin. Last question. I'll go down to live. We'll finish up. Well, you all want to talk about four arc basins. I just think of a four arc basin as a, as a passive basin between two uh, active mountain building areas. Um, maybe you have something real important for me about four arc basins, but I don't. I don't see them as that important. But I guess you guys are into that part of it. We'll finish with Joe's question. Are accretionary wedges considered exotic terrains? You know that I don't get too hung up on terminology and properly defining certain things. And maybe that really bothers you if I'm teaching a science class and I'm not teaching vocabulary words, but that's just not my choice. Of, that's not how I choose to teach. So is this, number one, accretionary wedge, a wedge in exotic terrain? I guess you could say yes and no. Yes, in the sense that the accretionary wedge, the Olympic Peninsula, is clearly made out of mass that originated in the ocean. It's exotic to North America. But I would also say, no, the Olympic Peninsula is not an exotic terrain, as we discussed it today because it was not a fully formed piece of material, an island or a, a plateau or uh, an island arc. It wasn't preformed as a land mass before it then got added to North America, which is classically the way to view an exotic terrain, which we will formally introduce tomorrow to our young people here. So yes and no, how about that? A toast to you. Here's a toast to you and your health. Here's a toast to all of your loved ones, family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, people in your neighborhood, people in your community of all shapes and sizes. What? I don't know about where you live, and it's not a contest necessarily, but our county continues to be full of very helpful people. There's a large pool of volunteers helping at the vaccine center down at the fairgrounds. I'm part of that team, so I'm working my volunteer shift at the vaccination center at the fairgrounds on Wednesday, and that happens to be the afternoon that my wife gets her second dose of Pfizer. Thursday is my second dose of Pfizer. And yes, I'm teaching on Friday morning about exotic terrains. Uh, less than 24 hours after getting the second dose. So you might tune in for Friday's show uh, for entertainment value. If I'm not speaking perfectly this morning, what will I be doing on Friday morning? I don't know. I'm dead inside, so it probably doesn't matter. A toast to you. Thank you for joining us. Chun height. I'll see you tomorrow morning. 
We will have a quiz, but I'll be showing you a slideshow, as I usually do for our quizzes, of some very special diagrams. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye.